afternoon, everybody. We'll try that again. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Tracy Abbott from Microlink. I'm really delighted that you're able to join us today for our physical accessibility talk. There are a couple of um, little factors that I wanted to, to, I forgot what we call them, but basically we've got um, Interact Streamer running. So you can actually access that so you can read what's going on as well. We will be recording and we will be sending out the recording as well as um, a, a resource page afterwards and would welcome any questions. Please either save them for the Q&A at the end. I know that Rehan's very excited to be challenged by you today. And if you've got any questions you want to ask immediately, please put them in the chat and we'll address them as we go along. So um, I don't know if you're aware that this is the fifth webinar that we've done in conjunction with the Department of Works and Pensions, specifically the Disability Confident Team. And we're actually looking at doing that really, doing as many different uh, webinars as we can to increase the knowledge that you have and sharing the learnings that we've got with you. And we would welcome those questions, so please write them down. Um, if you would like, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Rehan Hussein, who is somebody that works with Microlink as a subject expert. He has over 20 years experience of doing audits. And I think I'm right in saying he's done over 5,000 of these. So it's fair to say that rather than perhaps some of the more tired rhetoric that we hear around physical accessibility, here's somebody with fresh new experience and experienced eyes on it. Um, Rehan, would you like to, to, to begin? Yes, thank you, Tracy, for such warm words. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, fifth in line. And today we are going to talk about physical accessibility. I know that when we usually talk about physical accessibility, we usually end up discussing the problems, what has not been done. So hopefully today I want to give you a different insight that physical accessibility is more than just ramps. Uh, as Tracy mentioned, uh, it's really not 20, it's closer to 15 years of experience, but in these 15 years of working with physical accessibility, I come across one common mindset amongst the people. Is It is basically that physical accessibility is about wheelchair users in need of a ramp. And that mindset, even though it's not a lie, it's still far from the truth. And you see two notions growing from this. One, that having this mindset, you're limiting yourself to a progress or potential progress. Secondly, if there is no ramp, the excuse is we cannot build one ramp, hence we cannot do anything. What I want to start off with is just to say that something can be done, that I can assure you. Uh, from the 8,000 audits that we have been participating in here in Sweden and across the world, we have learned that something can be done rather than nothing can be done. And hopefully today, by the end of today, we can open up insight to ability to see beyond the ramp. Microlink is well known when it comes to accessibility and working with accessibility. Since 1992, we are known with our services within WPA, Workplace Adjustments, but also DSA. Throughout the years, we have, been, we have helped over 500,000 people to succeed. And beyond the United Kingdom, Microlink is operating in United States, South Africa, and Middle East, just to mention a few. What comes into mind with WPA and DSA at Microlink? is that both of these services take part in a built environment. And this is where I come in the picture. My name is Rehan Hussain, and today, currently, Head of Physical Accessibility at Microlink. And we realize when Microlink and I were speaking that, how can we tie the knot? How can we make the services more accurate? Because while WPA, Workplace Adjustments, consider a person's work working environment, seldomly it considers how the access is to the bathrooms or the entrances and such. And this is where we can contribute to making the service even more better. Because during the 15 years, one thing I picked up quite early was the mindset that people had 
or we don't we do not have we do not have a rap or we have a rap it stopped there and the entire discussion fell apart so i would like to describe myself as a progress oriented person focus on what can be done because as i said earlier something can always be done and that is what i hope we can contribute to today because either it's working with malls hospitals heritage buildings churches fortresses we've always found one common ground something can be done and it it is more than just ramps i've just recently joined the amazing team at micronic and it is since march 2021 that uh, i've been operating with uh, physical accessibility here at, at micronic what is physical accessibility to understand physical accessibility we must understand it's taking place in the built environment the built environment consists of two main sectors one the existing built environment where you have schools shopping centers malls hospitals and then you have the other sector the newly buildings the buildings or areas that will be built both of these have their own limitations existing built environment is a place where we are restricted to space per se while we can do other aspects we can do other things within physical accessibility most of the time it's a limit we are limited to space which then means that we need to create solutions in order to create a progress towards an inclusive society the biggest challenge we have within the newly buildings are the people involved the architects the planners construction sites and contractors we are open to the ability to provide an inclusive society with very little barriers but the problem comes down to the people and their mindset not always knowing how to move on from seeing beyond the ramp and so on and physical accessibility in this entire area is all about how the built environment interacts with people and vice versa because our ability to access society on equal terms is not constant same throughout the years my needs when i was in 20s was totally different than my needs when i became a parent suddenly i had two young girls and i was running around with a carrot a uh, stroller i think it's called yes and so you see that the needs and the change the needs change over time and this is why we need to cre consider creating a built environment which we can access on equal terms because if i start to speak swedish like now om jag börjar prata svenska mer så kommer många inte kunna förstå even though you were able to understand me just a minute ago you did not understand what i just said this is where you just experienced becoming cognitive impairment consider tourists these are the things these are the groups that we can relate to tourism parents what we very fail is following the people who are being affected by an inaccessible environment need to say people with visual impairment seizures limited mobility and this is where the trick this is where the tricky part starts to begin occur very few of us can can actually relate to the needs to these groups relate to what needs to be done because while we're thinking of physical accessibility as wheelchair users and ramps you're forgetting the part where these groups who are not catering who are who are more than wheelchair users what type of needs they need and this is the reason far too long has a society previously ignoring the groups and their needs far too long have we built ramps we have built solutions and we consider them to be accessible but they're accessible for 85% because this is where the equality act 202010 came into place where it talks about physical barriers in built environment should be removed it's quite strong word should be removed the problem is that even though there's a regu regulation legislation in place 
we still do not understand that 1.5 billion people around the world are facing these barriers on every day in their lives. And accessibility itself is about creating an accessible environment for everyone. Take a moment to think about what accessibility means to you. What would happen if you were to injure your, your leg in a skiing trip for three, four months using a wheelchair? These are things that often come up. And I'm the first one to say that we cannot build ramps. We, ramps are not the solutions and we will never be able to provide ramps everywhere. But there are solutions that we can provide which are quite effective, but also quite important. Because one of the things, if you look at this, we have a ramp mentality. You have a ramp in the background, which is giving access. The problem with this ramp is it's too steep, both for parent pushing a stroller, but also for the, the wheelchair user. There is no handrails. 10 years ago, if I were to access this ramp, I would be afraid because what happened if I would slip? What would happen to my kids? In this case, you cannot rebuild the ramp because that will be too costly. And we can advise people other ways. More than that, what we can do more are, for instance, visual impaired people. The, the stairs contrast and for elderly people. This is where we start looking at the problem. We're not talking about focusing our attention towards a ramp that is not good. We're talking about focusing our attention on what can be done because this ramp might not be the first thing we should prioritize right now. We should focus on what we can do easily for the other groups that actually can access the building on better terms than a wheelchair user. Because our society is at disadvantage due to current mentality. And the reason is not only the 1.5 billion people that are being excluded, it's where our society is headed overall. Because the impact from, if we do not change our behavior or mindset, we are creating an exclusion, which is causing poor health and higher, higher poverty rate amongst those that are already excluded. This is creating a higher price tag on our society. It is our society that is actually paying for not building it correctly. Because it is, it is impacting on our health system. The low education that is quite common amongst those that are excluded is causing higher crime rate in the next generation that's coming. So we are in a very bad circle in terms of not addressing this properly. Because an inclusive society impacts the business community. Today, 85% of people who are the business's backbone are not impacting. But in a society where the, where the aging society is becoming more, far more, consider the fact that we are creating a disaster for ourselves by 2050. If our elderly, elderly society is excluded the same way we're excluding 1.5 billion people today. At the age of 65 and above, we are running at a rate of 35% of developing some type of disability. And if we consider to provide, provide the same society that we are providing today, imagine by 2050, how we as elderly will be excluded slowly because we are not part of the system. What that will do to a society where the birth rate already is causing a decrease, decrease in taxpayers. This be, is becoming a big issue to the extent that the United Nations and the countries around are now discussing this issue on a more serious level. As I mentioned, everything's not just bad, but what can we do? And this is what it's all about today. What can we easily do? We might not solve all the problems of the world, but what can we do in terms of creating the progress? To your 
in front of you, you see two pictures. Imagine a building where you have the entrance to the left and you have the interior. Again, you have a wrap, you have stairs, and this is how a lot of landlords or facility managers are happy with. They're happy with, they have a ramp, they have stairs and everybody can access it. So what can be done? What can be done here? 95% of the time, nothing is done here. And that is where the problem is. Because if I would to switch to the following, same building, same environment, you can start, you can now see the changes. The changes in the left with the dots that you see on the beginning of the ramp and end of the ramp, the stairs. You can also perhaps note the black white stripes that we have put over here. But the biggest change is to the picture to the right, where you see the tactile trail. You see the contrast of the door frames. You see the clear contrast of the stairs. Because if I go back to this picture, this is where our reality is. This is where the building situation is today compared to where we can go with very little efforts, so to speak. But this is the design. How does it look in reality? I just chosen one bathroom in a built environment. This is from a building in central London. To the left, you see the entrance. And then you see how it looks in the middle picture. There are two WCs in there. And the last one is actually in front of the WC. This is the environment many of us can actually relate to. The question here is, what can we, what can be done? Let's take a step back and look at what is what the impact from this is. The previous picture that I just showed you indicate how the environment impacts on visually impaired and cognitive impaired individuals. How? Because lack of visual contrast. This is a building that was re refurnished, I would say, not more than a few years back. And the lack of contrast, visual contrast, on areas such as the door frames, the light reflective signage, the current fit out in the WC. Small things that can mean a lot for those that are affected by it. We're not talking about installing a new door opener. We're not talking about um, making sure that the wheelchair WC. We're talking about what can we do with small means, small efforts. And this is where the business starts to look at it. A lot of times they will acknowledge the need that yes, we, we need an RWC or we need an elevator, we need a ramp. And then considering the cost to install this, people stop because there's no budget for it. And this is where we are asking the business owners to look at the current signage, it is too high, how can we replace it? It's too reflective. Small means that can mean a lot. Next slides, few slides, I'll be focusing on actual pictures and ideas to plant the idea of what can we do. And you will see that I'm giving the same type of message over and over again. And I hope that that message can show where we have most of the problems today and what we really need to do in order to create a more inclusive world. But looking at this store, what can easily be done? If I would say with less than 150 pounds, you can approach, you can- Wow. Actually, sorry? Wow, sorry, I was just surprised how cheap it was then, sorry. Yes, uh, well, even less than 150 pounds. This would be the, the door frame is somewhere around 35 to 40 pounds, just a contrast. And then you have a contrast behind this. And then you have a signage. I want you to look at, I want the audience to look at the signage. It is in Swedish. The funny part with this signage is that it, is, it has pictograms, which also indicates what is behind. So suddenly, Swedish doesn't matter. Just like English. People expect everybody to understand, but sadly not everyone does. We need to start working with pictograms. 
One may say that the picture to the left has pictograms. Yes, the problem with that pictogram is it is a design. It is not something that is standard. People with cognitive impairment are taught over 16,000 pictograms during their school. Just, to, just as we communicate with language and spoken words, people with cognitive impairment communicate with pictograms. And those pictograms cannot be different than what they're taught. It is like I would start to speak Swedish in this webinar from nowhere, and nobody will understand me. That is how pictograms need to have the same. Same time, putting up solutions such as this, uh, this signage that you have to your right, they have to be able to spot it with considering the light. We're not asking the environment to change the lighting. We're asking to choose the materials that does not reflect the lighting. In this case, this is a main entrance to an elderly uh, building, a building with, that provides elderly care here in Sweden. You already see that there is a door opener, automated door opener here, which was installed. And you also have installed a metal threshold ramp. For 10 years, this client considered this to be the solution. And I'm not, I'm not joking. 1,800 buildings in Gothenburg, including hospitals, clinics, schools, kindergarten, elderly homes, all of them had this solution where it needed. And for 10 years, they considered them, them, them to be accessible. It was when 2015, when Gothenburg won the, the Accessibility Award for Europe, that the politicians start to understand that what they had done was nothing compared to what needed to be done. What can we do? To the right, you will see exactly within a few weeks' time, this is what we managed. Again, we are looking at a cost for less than 200 pounds. I am not, I've chosen not to zoom in, which I will do in the next picture, but you can see it from the left and right, which of these, these environments you would rather pick. And those that don't consider themselves to have an impairment, I'm thinking people would rather pick the right side rather than left. And this is what it's about, the common sense. The picture to the right does not consider a specific group. It considers everybody who has the need. I would go on and say that we could install better lighting. I would go on and say that we should, we should have a clear path where the seating areas are. But right now, no. The easy things right now are to create something that everybody can enjoy and then focus on the bigger issues later on. And this is the same picture with a zoom in. As I said, mentioned earlier, this is the typical solution this municipality had. You see the threshold ramp, and you see the door opener that is not in this picture, but will to the left. For a person who cannot see, needs to be aware of the door opener when the door is opening. And this is the solution we had. The second challenge we face in our society is not about what needs to be done, it's how to do it. As you may notice to the, the pictures to the right, you have circles on the asphalt and then you have a metal contrast marking on the metal. Suddenly, looking at easy solutions, knowing what can be done and not limiting yourself by saying nothing can be done because we don't have the knowledge. And this is where, this, so this is where the biggest challenge is. People with lack of insight, people with lack of no, insight and product know-how often stick to this. 10 years is what people in Gothenburg had to face when they visited sites like this. In three months, we had conducted over 400 buildings where we installed these simple solutions. That can be seen by much more people. And if I were to say what type of products these are, I will summarize them with these two pictures. 
the products to your left, the tactile trail, the contrast marking around the doors openers indicate that with this, we can actually achieve more than 60%. We can cover 60% of the barriers around us. And I've, I could show much elegant background, but what I want to show is with these solutions, they're so cost effective that you don't need to put, a, put them in a, some expensive brochure. We just had them like this so that people actually realize the value of doing so much and achieving, taking care of 65% of the berries can be done with so little money. Conclusion of what, we are, what you have been listening to is creating accessible spaces is not only a must, but a way forward. We're looking at aging societies today. We're looking at 1.5 billion people already being excluded. You're looking at declining birth rate. All that will impact on our, on our cost in the society. Declining birth rate actually means people that are not paying taxes. Not, not enough people will be able to pay taxes, which are needed to cater the needs for aging society. This is not about looking at disabled communities. It's about looking at our future, where we are headed. Even though it can be hard to relate to uh, Asian societies with the contrast around the doorframe, but that is actually very closely connected in how we are looking at things. You need to find solutions that work for us, that work for us all, in order to create this, this inclusive society. Thank you very much. I hope uh, I'm looking forward to any questions or discussions around this. And uh, my apologies, my first language is Swedish. I thought I could speak very good in English and I apologize if any pronunciation or words were not uh, pronounced correctly. Thank you. Rehan, thank you so much. And your English is amazing. I don't know a single word of Swedish, so that, that's wonderful. As Emma says, your English was superb and it really is. Um, we, had a, we had a question from, um, oh, from Stephanie Robinson saying, is there an open source guide of more easy to do changes, please? Um, there is one that's available, Rehan. I think you've been involved with Jodie Greer, is it, from her maturity model that was launched Monday, I think it was? Correct. There, there are these models and Jodie Greer has done an amazing job by creating this maturity model. What we would like to recommend in addition to that is actually having a product knowledge because the first time half of my presentation, it was about what you can do easily. And that uh, the, the, the maturity model that Jody provides mentions exactly those points. The second where I start to show the pictures and you saw the variation in mm. the usage, that is where we need to have a product catalog or a catalog so that people, that are, that are willing to do these, these, uh, these uh, remediations. They know what type of products can be chosen. And if I may just go back to one picture, I'll go back to this picture to the right. I was working with Wasex, one of the biggest facility managers here in Sweden, uh, 10 years back. Mm. We were working with over 800 buildings in central Gothenburg, Stockholm, Malmo, the three biggest cities in, in Sweden. We did not have the solution back in 2010. So today, the, all their buildings have solutions for indoor environment. This solution we created by ourselves. Uh, sorry, where the, where's the cursor? Now? Yes. This solution is something that is an outcome when we start noticing the limited product availability in market, that we start to play with other products. For instance, the, you may laugh, but these circles are actually the same product as the white lines that you see in asphalt. Oh. We, start, we, start buying, we start buying the rolls and we start to, yeah. uh, to uh, cut them out in circles. Wow. So this is, this, is, was, this is needed. This is what the industry lacks today. Oh. The innovation, and uh, even though this might sound silly, but we need innovation. We need an innovative mindset approaching these issues. We also need, I mean, there have been a couple of questions about um, functionality and form 
which come up quite often in terms of, you know, the architect or whoever it is within the business has gone, this is a really beautiful reception desk, for example, or somebody mentioned door handles. Um, and they've gone, they don't want to change them to make them accessible because they're just so beautiful. What's the answer to that, Rehan? Well, again, this is where the, where the, the, the problem starts. It's not what the solution to that is the answer. No, it's about, can we do something about the background instead? Mm. I, would, I would say, let's say that you have installed a reception desk, which has costed you a lot of money. Yeah. And suddenly somebody comes and says, You're, it's wrong. What I would say to that landlord or that organization is focus less on changing the desk because I understand it's not sustainable to change it right now again, but to inform on the internet, on your webpage. Mm. This is where we stop looking around to find other solutions because I would rather have a higher desk but be informed so I'm aware of it rather than coming there and not having access to the person because I cannot see it over the desk. Mm. Again, common sense and uh, uh, problem. It's pragmatic, isn't it? Pragmatic yes. solutions to everything. One of the things that I wanted to know was how common is the Gothenburg, the picture we've got here, how common is that um, in the UK? I know you've been over quite a few times. Do you see the same challenges? Well, I would say like this. Yes, I do see the same challenges. Oh. Uh, and the challenges are not due to how we build. It's how we as humans act and react. Because when I was speaking to uh, a government official in Pakistan, they said, well, you guys and you in Sweden have, you can afford more. Oh, and you have. That's why we are we are a poor country. We cannot do anything. And I said, you are better. You have better advantage because you can now reconstruct everything better from the beginning. Mm. While Sweden has a built environment that has such historic impact that it's hard to change. So again, it's all about people and their mindset and how we behave towards things we do not know and relate to. How important do you think it is to actually? <clears throat> include the employee resource group or ERGs or the disability working group within a business if like a lot of companies they change the environment over the pandemic they've had a refreshes of the office how important is it to include disabled people within that design process well it, it has if I can be very frank about it it mm, has please. advantages and disadvantages okay. in this case if I would say the disadvantages if I would say this is where Gothenburg was with this building since 2007. And to be honest, this building actually was the first building I audited back in April, 2007. Wow. Since 2007, nothing happened until 2019. This is where we actually did it. So the problem was that you have a landlord who then involves the, the people renting the building there. And then you have all the other groups with all their mindset. Some of the progress that we need to make, we need to have a tailored solution that is from a landlord's aspect in terms of you cannot provide a door opener right now for some reasons, very recent. Mm. When it comes to redesigning, where you might need to rebuild this entire place, I would say involving others is a must. But in this type of level of progress, you can actually, you can actually conduct progress by your own if you know what type of solutions and progress you are most suitable to. Okay, so it's, it's being aware difference. and being pragmatic about what you can do to make it more accessible. We've got yes. a question from um, one of the um, attendees asking about, is there any guidelines to make art exhibitions and art workshops accessible to everyone? If you had asked me this 2007, I could say no. Today, there are work being done, yes. But then again, if you cannot find them, I cannot just from top of my head say that, but I would say, have a chat with us. And if they're not, then let's make one. Because- Fantastic, I love that. That is, that is, I would say like this, and this might sound a bit crazy. Imagine a world where the light, light bulb has just been introduced. Yeah. It took us 30 years to understand the needs and the services needed in order to cater for the, need, the needs. And this is where we are with accessibility. Not everything has been invented yet. And even though this might sound like it should, there is space for everybody to actually start contributing to this because 
I believe just as we do at Microlink, we think we have a shortage of over 10 million people working with accessibility around the world. And right now I would say we're less than a million. Sorry, Rehan, that's the dogs, not you. Apologies. <laughs> no problems, no problems. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was done. Uh, I think Tracy just muted herself. So uh, let's see if I can take any questions from the chat. I don't see anything. Yes, yeah, somebody's just mentioned that. I uh, apologies. I'm trying to cut out my two rather barky dogs today. Um, okay. Somebody mentioned about the Alzheimer Design uh, Society doing a dementia-friendly art guide. So there might be some information that we can pick from that. But I think what we're trying to to get to here is use the experience that Rehan has got. We want you to use and abuse him thoroughly. Um, he does know an awful lot about accessibility. He's worked around the world. And I think it's quite interesting that there are some basic things that come up time and time again around toilets, for example. I mean, you, you've touched upon that rehan, but I mean, I, I've been talking to a few people who are stoma patients, for example, and having that sort of the drop down um, shelf in the loo so that people have got a mirror, they can actually change their stoma bags, they're not worried about it going everywhere. Um, and they've got a hand basin in the loo as well. There's some really basic things that people can do. And I think what you're coming across with here is the fact that a lot of this stuff is actually low hanging fruit and very inexpensive. Definitely. And again, uh, it is not about, I can, I can tell you this, we can, we can never have 100% accessibility, never. Mm. Because imagine a person being allergic to uh, animal hair, like dogs, Oh, wow. and a person with a dog, they cannot be in the same environment. So it doesn't matter what we do, we cannot we, have, we cannot accommodate those two groups at the same time. So taking a step back again, the low hanging fruits that you mentioned, Tracy, mm. are all about looking at what you have and what you can do, not what you should be doing. Because this is where the problem occurs that if you start focusing on what should be done, we we end up thinking about what should be done and not actually I'm acting. Not sure yeah. Would you could you give us say our top I'm being a bit cheeky here could you give us say our top five things that people could take away from this session and go and look at the environment that they're working in currently? Well, I would say like this. I could, I could pick over a thousand pictures to show. I just pick I just showed you three pictures that mm. focus on door contrast, signages, level different contrast in stairs, mm. and window contrast. That, those are the four things that. I can assure you, it doesn't matter if you have an old church that's 1,000 years old or a new mall. Wow. So it really is four things. We're talking about ingress, egress, and then just how people can find their way around a building. Yeah, yes, definitely. Are the and pictograms I, a bit like emojis so that they're recognized internationally? Well, there are standards that are coming to place right now. I know that uh, the sister, the what do you call the ADA has mm. these. And if you look at these pictograms right now, I know that European Union is talking about standardization. Yeah. And uh, even though, let's say like this, that I know pic uh, signages with pictograms are not so common today. And people end up looking at this type of solution to the left. Yeah. The second thing that is alarming in this, that a lot of suppliers do take, sorry to say, they take an advantage of clients not knowing what they have. So for instance, during the span of five, six years, this pictogram was costing 70 to 80 pounds because of the clients not knowing the real cost to manufacture it. Mm. This caused a big disturbance in order because this is this was cost, this was considered to be a costly solution when they actually cost not more than 15 to 25 pounds right. to manufacture. And this is also something that our market has to be aware of that these products that I just showed, because people do not know the availability, the cost goes up. And that is something that is a big risk for progress because if you end up paying 70 pounds for a signage and you have to order 15,265 signages for- Wow, hospital, yes. Imagine the cost and that just put them off. So again, that's something that they need to look at. It's not only the solution, but the, the, the prices that they're being charged. Are they reasonable? And this is something that I really love with Microlink that I know speaking to Nasser and uh, the executive group here, we have, talk, we have spoken about 
solutions that actually are affordable, not yeah. solutions yeah. that are look nice and fancy. And this is why I showed you this picture without putting so much effort in. Yeah, no, it's important. We've got a couple of questions I wanted to ask. We've got, um, Jason's asked, how can captioning on videos be used to help create more accessibility? Um, Jason, we use captioning in all sorts of communication systems to try and capture everybody's needs. If there's something that we've missed or you'd like to talk to me offline about that specifically, um, I'd welcome that conversation. We've also got a question around what would you say to employers, Rehan, um, who use working from home as a, quote, get out from adapting their environments? So if you've got it, you've got home workers, which an awful lot of us have done during the pandemic, or even hybrid workers, what, what's the responsibility of the employer? Should they be making the home accessible? This is a very, very tricky question in terms of it is easy to say either or, but uh -huh. we have to understand that I read an article in BBC just in the midst of pandemic that a lot of people that could not leave their home actually start to experience what it felt like for the people that had been living the life before the pandemic. For sure. And we have to understand that it doesn't matter if you're starting to work from home. I know working from home impacts on different regulations. And I know that the society, as we see today, is about to change because we're not utilizing the public spaces. Uh, and I would like to reserve my thoughts on that because I know that if we are still going to the offices, we should focus on that. And if you are still working from home and that is where the trend is leaning towards, the employers have to make sure that the access to the services are just as good in terms of uh, what, how they would be if you were working from office. Can, can does I that make try, sense? Can I try yes, also it does. to add? Sorry, Nasa, uh, yes. Tracy, yeah, hi. Um, I think, um, it depends on how the employees view their employees. Do they want productivity? Because obviously, if you talk to employees, say, well, they live in that house, so they must be okay, because uh, they don't need adjustment when they, uh, they live in their own homes. But not if they have to work. If they have to do a day's work, they'll be subjected to the same working condition as in a workplace. So the environment really doesn't matter. Uh, can they do their work efficiently and productively? So if the employees look at that employee as an investment and they want more return on that investment, then they have to provide the right equipment, the right environment for them to do their work. So I, I don't think it's a matter of legal obligation, which there is, of course there is, but I think they should look at the employee's well-being and their productivity, which, which is the, really the biggest return on investment you get. Absolutely. It, it makes perfect sense to do it. And not to do it is really just a poor excuse if you... If you I mean, to give you, give you some example, when, when I joined um, Microlink, I went through access to work when I first started with the business. I've got, I don't know whether you can see because it's blurred out, I've got an ergonomic chair, I have a riser table, and I've got software that was fitted because I work from home. This is my office, so it's like I'm in the Microlink offices in Southampton, but just kind of in a TARDIS weird way, based in Battle in Hastings. But yeah. I've got the adjustments made to do my job well. And, and it, you know, you should be looking at access work to help fund that, uh, and your business should be looking to fund that sort of thing. Sorry, Rehan. No, no, uh, please don't say sorry. Thank you so much, Nasser, uh, for that wonderful answer. And this is why I've only focused on physical accessibility, while Microlink is very good at WPA. So Nasser has, is a very good source, a person I'm learning a lot from personally. So thank you. Yes, uh, do we have any questions or? We've got a few, we've got a lot of comments on here about getting funding to get your home made accessible. I know it's something that we're looking at doing a lot more with Rehan's help is to make um, people who are working ho uh, either home-based or hybrid working to help companies look at the physical accessibility. There are issues around PAT testing for the electrics. There are issues around evacuation plans, I believe, Rehan. Sorry, I did not get the last one. I'm sorry. Tracy. Sorry, uh, evacuation plans, personal evacuation plans for people when they're they're working from home. So there's other issues as well as the, the basics, looking at the the doorways, the windows, the loos, etc. I can suggest that 
when, it, when we work with accessibility, especially in Sweden, people do not think about the evacuation plans, like exiting the building. We were more keen on getting the people in. And I know that this is not the most uh, common sense. There's no common sense in not looking into that. And it is a must, definitely. But it does provide its challenges. I wanted to ask you as well, is we, we looked at the four or five things that, that can be done. We've looked at what the average costs are, I think, for those things. Um, there are a lot of questions that are coming up around um, access to work, which can I just say, if people would like to contact um, Microlink directly about that, we're more than happy to, um, to actually have that conversation with you. On the physical side, which is what Rehan's looking at, he's, I mean, we, we've done some audits, well, you've done some audits more precisely recently for large high street banks, haven't you, where you've had individuals that have become um, visually impaired uh, and looking at making a difference from them actually having to leave work because of this yeah. and then staying in work. What, what happened with a bank? Well, interesting, uh, interesting that you brought it up because uh, my previous experience from auditing has always been to imagine an empty building space. Oh, okay. okay. Yes, uh, because that is what the law says. You need to make it accessible. But because Microlink has such strong roots with WPA, we were invited, well, I was invited to do, conduct an audit from how it was impacting on the employee. And as I did my audit, when I spoke to the person uh, in the end, a new world opened in terms of experience that the person was looking at. And all I could see was this person is facing so many challenges in, in the day-to-day -day life that they were not being able to operate and focus on their task, despite the fact that they had 35 years of experience. It was a few years recently that they, they've have experienced the visual impairment, which now was causing them to think about their environment and their surroundings more than how they could perform their task. From my end, what I could see was this employer has an investment of 35 years, which now was bleeding money because that person was not operating at its best. And it was due to an inaccessible environment. With solutions that we could actually do within a day, the person can actually start operating much at a much better rate. And this is something that is so important that the built environment became the biggest flaw for this person. No longer the experience that this person has, it didn't matter how many years this person had worked, the built environment became the biggest challenge. And that's where the focus was from this person instead of what a person does. I think it's amazing how willing the company has been to, to rectify that though, haven't they? Rather than have somebody go out uh, work. That is so relevant because uh, many disabled people used to work in their office environment quite comfortably. Suddenly they've been thrown into a bit of a confusion after the COVID uh, with the agile working and offices are basically rearranging and the entire familiarity is gone. So you have mm -hmm. to really start all over again. Hence, um, if you ever want to have a return to work on a serious um, scale, then uh, companies really should do another um, accessibility audit before they start inviting their disabled colleagues back, because things would have probably changed beyond the recognition. Yeah. I just wanted to remind everybody at this moment, because we've, we've only got a very short time left. Um, before we go, we do have uh, another webinar. As I mentioned, this is our fifth one. Um, we will be sending out the recording. If you've got any more questions, please pipe up. If you want to contact Rehan um, afterwards, he would welcome having conversations with you. Uh, I've put my email and Rehan's email into the chat. If any of you need it again, please, again, let us know. Um, it's such a huge subject, Rehan. Really, just to reiterate, you're saying, think about the top five things which were, reiterate them. What were the top five things? Four or five things, well, contrast, door frame contrast, window contrast, signages, stair contrast. These cover almost 65% of your problems that we have today. Wow. I mean, guys, that is really straightforward, isn't it? Um, 
we've had a lot of chat, as I said, about people working from home, getting access to work. As I've put in the chat, if people would like to contact me about that, I'm more than happy to, to help and give some advice and see if we can support. Some of the things that we are looking at is some more unbranded uh, workplace adjustments that could be a solution to some of the challenges that are coming up. Um, Rehan, is there anything that you would like to say before we, we cut off from this? Well, I would say that I hope we the message that was that was given was quite hopefully it was inspiring and I'm all my door is always open or the email and thank you for sharing the email and I would love to carry on with any questions that you might have so please feel free to contact us here. I, I really really trust and as we reiterate your English is fantastic. <laughs> um, the next uh, webinar that we got is on the 17th of May, which will be on tech assistance which I think is going to be fascinating. But Rehan, seriously, it, it, it's, it's such an understated but so straightforward to get right situation with a physical accessibility. Um, I want to see everybody going off and looking at the doors, windows and contrasts and then coming back and saying, Rehan, how do we resolve it? Well, so hopefully you will all do that. Nasser, are there any last words that you would like to? No, no, thank you again for another... A great webinar. Um, you've, you've been a brilliant host today, Tracy, and thank you to the audience. Thank you very much for those that are listening. We will send this out. We will send the recording out. We will also send out a resource sheet um, that Anna, our marketing manager, and Rehan will put together for you. And please, if you've got any other questions, if you can come back to us, that would be wonderful. Let me just check on the chat that there's nothing else. Uh, copies of events. Lots of thank yous, Rehan. Um, really brilliant session. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll see you all on the 17th.